Uh, my name is Todd Sharp. I'm here to talk to you today about adding live interactive video to your applications with Amazon Interactive Video Service, or IVS. I'll probably call it IVS a lot, uh, but it's Interactive Video Service. And here's our agenda. We're just going to kind of go over what it is, why you might want to use it, take a look at some of the SDKs, and then we're going to actually get in, create a channel, broadcast, and create playback all within the next hour. So. Sounds like a lot to cover, but honestly, it's uh, something that you'll find, hopefully, just as simple as I find it to, to learn and to use. We'll also take a look at interactivity. That Obviously, that keyword I used in the title is interactive live video, and what that means, how you can take advantage of that. So I am a full stack developer. You may notice that picture was taken a, way back a long time ago. No, actually, it was last summer, and I dyed my beard. so. Pretend like, uh, pretend like that looks like me. <laughs> so I'm a developer advocate. I work for Twitch. You've all heard of Twitch, the, the video game streaming company. So Twitch was purchased a long time ago by Amazon. So we're owned by Amazon. And we'll get into this, of course, but Amazon Interactive Video Service was born out of Twitch. It was, uh, it's actually an AWS service. So if you go to AWS Cloud, you can use all of the things that we're going to look at today. But it is a live streaming service that allows you to create live streaming applications, either full focused on user content like Twitch or some of the competitors that are out there, YouTube Live, Instagram Real, you know, Live, all of these things, or just integrate one portion into your application. So the application doesn't have to be focused on live streaming as the sole product. Maybe you're a conference organizer and you want to add a, a live streaming element to your website for your conferences. Maybe you're, um, whatever, there's educational uses, sporting uses, e-commerce, all kinds of things. I can be found at these different places if you're interested in learning more or connecting up with me. I blog quite a bit. I also run a live stream on twitch.tv slash AWS every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, which is today and 4 p.m. Eastern is actually 9 p.m. tonight, so I'll be in the hotel running a live stream. But uh, we talk about all things streaming. So before we get into everything, and I'm not a marketer by any means, but I want to look at some kind of numbers and like very interesting statistics that kind of back up the growth of live streaming in the industry and kind of gives you some perspective as to the impact and why it matters. These are all from this website that you found below. It's a survey that was, was done. So 63%, how many of you all watch live streams? Do you ever watch a live stream? Yeah? What, gaming, just social, what, what kind of streams, if you don't mind sharing? Sometimes trading channels. Okay. There's, um, I met uh, Michelle Mish uh, from GitHub, and she does uh, quite a lot of streaming. She was telling me she does live coding, she does, she does gaming. So um, there is a lot of good coding channels out there. Any, anything else? Gaming? Yeah. Speed runs. My son loves watching those things. It's, I've watched some of them. It's kind of cool to see, like, the... I always see the, for some reason, I always see the Super Mario ones. There was like some controversy, I guess, that some guy cheated or something, but it's crazy how, so 63% of people ages 18 to 34 watch live streaming content regularly. That number almost seems low to me because my kids are watching it all the time. I don't know what they consider regularly, but um, this is an interesting stat, live streams tend to get 27% more watch time than on-demand content. So if you either have a live stream versus a YouTube video, live streams gen generally tend to get more minutes of watch time. 80% of consumers prefer, this is, I don't know if I agree with this one, but again, it's, it's a study that they performed. I don't know if there's any bias involved, but 80% prefer live videos from a brand versus reading a blog. I guess, again, it depends on the context. Sometimes I kind of rather read a blog when it comes to, at least when I'm trying to solve coding problems or stuff, I'd rather click on a blog and read it than watch somebody talk about it because you never know how in that hour long video, where's my answer, you know? In this blog post, I can at least scroll or hit control F and, and find the answer. 
79% say live video provides more authentic interaction with an audience. I agree with this one. I think obviously live video, especially interactive chat and things like that, are much more engaging to an audience. 60% say getting real-time feedback is a key benefit, obviously. Any guesses as to this number? What per this blew my mind. And it's not a... What percentage of Gen Z prefers using TikTok and Instagram search over Google? The answer is 40%. That's a huge, right? That's a lot of... So we're, we're seeing this paradigm shift in how content is consumed on the web. My kids are Gen Z, they're teenagers, and so for every 10 of their friends, four of them would search TikTok for an answer before they search Google. That kind of blows my mind, but it, it kind of illustrates where our industry is going and what the next generation is using to find answers, to find products that they buy. I'd be willing to bet that you all know somebody, if you're like me, it's your wife, who buys stuff because somebody on Instagram said that this is a cool product. But it really makes sense though because most of the time, some of the times, it's more obvious that it's kind of sponsored. And, but a lot of times you get a genuine review of a product from somebody, you're gonna buy, you're not, not buy, I don't mean buy as in purchase, you're going to believe that more than if a corporate person who's paid to sell you something is coming on and telling you about it. So what is IBS? What is interactive video service? This is kind of the fancy slide, but essentially it's a way to create your own live streaming channels. So similar to Twitch, um, how Twitch you can go and search, every user has their own channel, and add interactive features to it. We have native SDKs, tons of them for web. We have uh, iOS SDKs, Android SDKs, every language that you can think of, we'll look at them in a second. You can auto record your streams. So if you wanted to create video on demand from like a catalog, past catalog of past broadcasts, you can do that very easily integrated. No spin up time is the other cool thing. You create a channel and you can live stream to it immediately. You don't have to wait for it to become live or it doesn't take minutes or hours, just immediately available. And latency, that's another big one. So glass to glass time, from the time I, I open my device and I hit broadcast, my glass, to your glass on your device or across the world, you're looking at two to five seconds of latency. This is a huge one because I've looked at, and I'm, I'm not a salesperson, but I've looked at some competitors and their latency is kind of not anywhere near what you can get with interactive video service. I'm talking like sometimes 30 seconds of latency between you know, broadcast and, and playback. And when you're thinking about like sporting events, that's just not good enough when it comes to a sporting event, especially when you consider sports betting or that kind of thing, right? You know, if, if a play happened and my buddy in the stadium saw it and told me, touchdown, and I, you know, I'm trying to bet on a live stream, I can, you know, basically cheat the system, so to speak. So there's a global infrastructure, private, you can do private channels, stream chat. It's fully managed, which is the nice thing. Now let's talk about why IVS, right? There's kind of this elephant in the room because there are, I mean, Twitch exists. You could go start a live stream right now. We're being live streamed right now on YouTube. There are free alternatives that you could use for live streaming. But with those come the dependence on the service that you're using, the branding of the service that you're using, the uh, limitations of the SDKs and embed APIs that they provide. So can you live stream with Twitch? Can you live stream with YouTube and integrate that in your application? Sure. NDC is doing it with this conference. It works. It does what they need it to do. If you wanted to build your own user-generated content platform, if branding is important, important to you, fuller control over the SDKs and playback and latency and all of those things, this is where you'd use IBS. So I'm not gonna tell you use IBS for everything. That's just not really what you should do. You should use the right tool for the right job, as always. So there's one more piece that we could talk about when it comes to why IVS. And the, answer, and the question that I'm talking about is why not just roll your own? 
There are open source libraries out there for live video streaming, hosting your own server. They do exist. I've used them way back before I even joined Twitch and talked about Amazon IBS, I've used them. And this is kind of the reason why you would not, in my experience, in my opinion, you could create an instance, maybe an EC2 instance, whatever. Maybe you have a server in your closet at home you want to use. You could do that. Then you have to update the OS, install prerequisites, you know, .NET, Java. If you're in the case of like some uh, open source, I know there's a lot of Java ones. Open your firewall, open your VPC, all of these things. Maintain all of that. Customize the code, add scaling, add load balancers. If you want to do all this and you have the manpower or the, the, the workforce to do this and the money to do this, you could do that. You're still, at the end of the day, going to end up probably with some latency issues because you're relying on the public internet to deliver and, and uh, to upload, ingest, and deliver your video. You could do this if it fits your needs again. That's great. But the last part that I kind of mentioned was the network, right? If you were to create your own server or use some of the alternative options, that latency. Let's think about a typical web request. When you go to you type google.com in your browser and you make that request, you do a trace route and you can see a list of all the ISPs that it hops through to get to from your, ser from your house, your browser, to that server to return that content to you. And you see all of these ISPs that it hops through. And that's just the nature of the internet. This is how the internet works. Your traffic is routed through various points in the public internet to get to the server that it needs to get to. Now normally, this is not a big deal. I live in Georgia in the United States, which is down here. I live way up in the middle of nowhere in the mountains by North Carolina. And that's as fun as it sounds like. No, I like living there. Where are you all from, by the way? UK? London. London? Norway, cool. UK, yes. UK, okay. So you're probably not as familiar with the US, but this is Georgia, Florida's down here, this is the DC area. So if I make a request to one of my servers, it goes, I, and I actually trace route, ran a trace route, took all the IPs from the trace route, plugged them into this mapping tool that can geo map IPs. So it's not 100% perfect, but it's pretty close. So my request went from my house to uh, Richmond, Virginia, and then up to DC. So that was 1.4 megs, took 172 milliseconds. Not bad, not bad at all. Think about requesting a site in Brazil. My request went from my house in Georgia to the DC area. Believe it or not, for some reason, from DC to Peru, back to California, and then down to Brazil. This is no joke. I literally, and then another stop in Brazil. I literally had to go back and look at the trace route three times. I'm like, really? It goes from there to Peru to California? But this is kind of how the internet works. And that was 112K, and it took 453 milliseconds. Not bad, not terrible. But if you think about the nature of live streaming video, if you were to rely on the public internet network like this, it's going to result in a lot of latency because your packets for your live video, if you had to wait 453 milliseconds for every packet to get from Brazil to Georgia, you'd end up with a lot of latency and, and video packets are not 112K. They're, they're a little larger than that, especially when you're talking about high quality video. So IVS, because it is this infrastructure that powers Twitch, it's basically the same exact network. It's all of the same servers, the same pops, the same ingest uh, origin data centers. We built this network to prioritize live streaming video. So we have a global network of pops that when you make a request either to upload, ingest your video, or someone makes a request to download and stream your video, they get the nearest pop to them and then that data travels on a private network directly to our origin data centers. So you bypass all of those public internet uh, hops that you normally would make, and you get a much better experience that's built for this low latency. 
We also have some edge CDNs that cache content in certain areas where there's less uh, demand. But essentially, this is kind of the uh, quick and easy version of explaining our network. So AWS SDKs for IVS. Um, if you're going to start working with IVS, a lot of people at Amazon and AWS talk about CDK, they talk about CloudFormation and Terraform. I see those tools as very valuable, but I see them less being used for IVS. And the reason I say that is because think of, uh, I hate to keep using Twitch as the example, but think of a Twitch, right? When your users sign up for an account, you create a channel for that user. It's not like a server or uh, a S3 bucket or something like that where it's a one-time creation. It's a constantly, it's something you're constantly gonna be doing in your application and from your application. You're not gonna do that at, at deployment time. You're gonna be doing that at runtime when users sign up and you wanna create your channel for them, you wanna create their chat room, these kind of things. So that's why I focus more on the SDK side of things as opposed to CDK and some of the other tools that are available. So language support, a lot of what we're gonna be seeing today, I know this conference is focused mostly on .NET. Uh, a lot of what my examples are gonna be are built in Node.js or JavaScript on the front end. But we do have full support for C++, all of the languages listed here, even Ruby, Python, um, PHP as well, which I didn't know a lot of people still use PHP, but I guess it's still fairly popular. Um, I haven't used it in years. So we have two main clients, and then again, we're looking at uh, Node. Be you'll see the package name up here of um, the Node package name. But the same applies for .NET, the same applies for Java, the same applies for Ruby, et cetera. Um, this particular package is the IVS client. So IVS, we have two clients, IVS and IVS chat. And both of them basically handle whatever you need to do with IVS. So the IVS client handles anything channel related. Creating channels, reading them, listing them, deleting them, creating stream keys, playback key pairs for private channels, recording configurations when you wanna to record to S3, as well as publishing timed metadata, which is a cool feature that we're gonna look at. There's also an IBS chat client, as I said, create a list update chat rooms, creating chat tokens. All of our chat rooms require the use of an authorization, uh, of basically a JWT token for every user that connects to it. And the reason that we do that is so you can do chat moderation, so you can make sure that um, you can, what's the right word? Um, replace, I don't want to say censor because people get <laughs> sensitive about that, but it's your application. If that's what your business rules are and your community rules are that you can't say uh, foo in your chat room, then that's what your community agrees to when they sign up for your service. So you can censor chat, you can delete chat, and that all requires that token so that when the server needs to perform that action, disconnect a user, delete a message, they know who needs to be deleted. So you delete messaging, disconnect users, all that sort of thing. So let's create a channel. There are a couple ways you can create a channel. The first way is to go right into the IBS console, the AWS console, go to interactive video service, click on create channel, go through the, you know, the typical kind of web UI form where you put in the name and make some selections. If you're doing a one-off channel for, like let's say NDC wanted to create four channels for all the different rooms at this conference, I'd probably use the console to do that because you're it's a one-off kind of thing. You're not gonna be doing a ton of them. You don't need to automate that. You can also create a channel with the AWS CLI. And I'll show you quickly how that is done. So to do that, we say IBS create channel. Give it a name. We have latency mode, and this is essentially a selection between low latency and normal latency. Some business, I've had some developers that I've talked to that say we don't really need super low latency, we just wanna make sure that everybody is on the same latency, right? Like you don't care if one user has two seconds, another has 10, 
if they all have 10, that's fine. We just want them all to have 10 so that they're all watching at the same time. Um, there are two different types of channels. If, um, not to get too deep, but if you're familiar with Twitch and you ever go on like a really popular streamer's channel, you might notice that the video quality is a lot better than the like streamers that stream to three people like me with their video game. Uh, and the reason that is is because the high traffic, high subscribed Twitch users get a what's called a transcoded stream. So they ingest at 1080p their video, and that video is transcoded into multiple different uh, qualities and multiple different bit rates so that users in some part of the world that has less quality internet can still have that low latency experience. It might be a little lower quality, but it's still going to be low latency because um, it's 720 or 480 as opposed to 1080. So um, a, a basic channel is what's called transmuxed, which doesn't change the quality or bit rate it just changes the format. So all video is ingested in, in what's called the RTMP format and delivered in HLS. So it has to change format in our server because I don't know how many of you are around in the Flash world. Do y'all any, y'all remember Flash? <laughs> Boy, you're lucky. <laughs> no, Flash wasn't bad. I worked with a lot of Flash. But Flash, RTMP is a Flash basically born out of the Flash world and there's no, way to play that anymore on the web. The Flash player is gone, it's dead. So it has to change format, but it's still a good protocol. Hey, come on in if you want to, if not, cool, whatever. Um, it's still a good format, um, it has its uh, uses, and that's why it's still used in a lot of places for ingest. It's just not delivered to the end user at, in that format. It's changed to what's called HLS. Uh, so, Transmuxed are not changed. If you have a 1080 input, it is delivered at 1080. If you have a 480 input, it's delivered at 480. Um, it's less expensive, and um, for some people, 480 is fine. For some people, 720 is fine. Depends on your use cases and your needs. Again, if you're building something like Twitch, you might say, okay, basic users get a transmuxed stream that's not transcoded, but premium users get a transcoded stream, something like that. So if we click that, we will realize that my security token is invalid and I need to re-initialize it. And I am not on the um, VPN, so <laughs> let me do that really quick, apologize. It is a gloomy day out, isn't it? I guess this is kind of normal for London, though, in, in January. How was the lunch? I didn't get to eat the lunch. Was it good? Yeah? Hey there. All right, clear that out, and we'll create our channel. And we immediately get this JSON result. Now this has some information. We're gonna need four pieces of this that I will um, talk about in a little more detail in just a minute. But the kind of key pieces to point out here are the ARN, which is the Amazon resource name, and it's just a unique identifier for this channel. If you want to do anything later on with the uh, SDK, as far as updating a channel or anything like that, you'll need that ARN to uh, refer to your channel. You also have an ingest endpoint right here. And this ingest endpoint is what you will use to broadcast your video. You're in, you're, uh, if you're going to use a third party software to ingest your video, this is the URL that you would use. Some other information, uh, more importantly, the playback URL. This is the, play, the URL to the playlist, so when you go to use the player later on, you'll plug this in, and that'll be how you play back. And at the very bottom there, you have your stream key. 
If you've ever done any, has anybody ever broadcast on Twitch? You have? So you're, you get a stream key from Twitch, you go to OBS or something and you plug that stream key in. Same, same exact thing. It's just a unique identifier. I will delete this immediately after so no one else can stream to my channel. Um, don't write it down. I see you taking a picture. Is it a real stream key? Yeah, this is it. This is real. It's brand new. I just created this channel. So this is a legit stream key. We're going to use it in just a second uh, to show you how it works. But yeah, this is your stream key. Um, you can program programmatically delete these stream keys. So if you ever found that somehow somebody leaked one of your stream keys and there's unauthorized broadcasting, you can delete it. You can shut down that stream either the, through the console, through the SDK, which is a nice feature. Um, I have a story, but I, I can't share it. But it would have been a nice feature to have in Twitch uh, because sometimes people do share keys. It's just, you, sh you shouldn't always do that. But I mean, the nature of like some teams, you know, people will broadcast to a single channel because there's a big user base, big followers. And so they share the keys. So sometimes you have to share keys. And um, the nice thing is you can delete them. You can stop people streaming. So that's the response from creating a channel. And as I said, I know I've been talking for a minute here. But as I said, you can immediately start using this. And we're going to, actually. And um, I actually <laughs> should have copied and pasted that. But we'll go to the console and we'll copy that. So if I refresh my console, we can see this is my brand new channel. <clears throat> so the one I just created with the CLI. If I come down here and I copy the stream key, this is my ingest server. So just like with Twitch, um, you can present this to your end users and this is how they would broadcast to their channel. So if I come over to OBS, this is a broadcast third party broadcasting software. And if I paste that stream key in and I start streaming, this Wi-Fi is making me slightly nervous. Okay. So we are now live streaming to our channel. And without having to create a playback experience with code, if we just wanted to test this out, we can come to the IVS console and go to the live channels on the left-hand side there. Is that font good enough? Or let me bump that up a little. So we can click the live channel and open up this. This is certainly loading much slower than it has been all day. Oh, I am not on the, I have somehow switched to a different network. Let's switch back to the presenter's Wi-Fi and hopefully that will make our lives easier. Oh, I'm also connected to my VPN still. So that would make things slower. Okay, so we'll go back here. We will start streaming again. Just make sure the stream is stopped. Okay, now if we come to live channels, we refresh, you do have three to five seconds of latency, as I said. And we scroll down. We can see our stream right within the console. So we can test out very quickly. Normally, it's even quicker than that. That stopped again. And I do promise you that this is an artifact of the Wi-Fi here, not of the service, because it's uh, when you stream, obviously, the ideal situation is to plug into an Ethernet. You don't do it over Wi-Fi. So it's a little harder to demo this in, in a conference session. But that's essentially how to create a channel and get started streaming to it. How else can you create a channel? 
You can also, as I said, do it with the SDKs, and we can do that right now. So again, this is the JavaScript SDK, and the first thing we need to do is create an instance of the client, create an input object, which is just an object, give it a name. Really, that's the only input we need. We can also specify the type if we wanted a standard channel versus a basic channel. And this is that transcode transmux difference that I was speaking of earlier. Create a command, create channel command, pass it that input, send the command. and then log the response. So this is the JavaScript SDK. Hopefully my token is still valid in here, which I'm sure it probably is not. It is not. Wait a second. Actually, that's a different error. This is... Uh, we want to import instead of use common JS. So my, bra my IDE messed me up here, but it still might give me that token error. Okay, good. My token was still valid in my IDE, but not at my command line. So same exact response, essentially, that we got from the CLI in JSON format. We created another new channel. We still have a, we have a new stream key we have a new playback URL. So let's use this one going forward. So I'm gonna copy this. Uh, actually, I'm gonna create a new terminal instance. No, I'm not, because that won't be authenticated. I will just scroll back up and copy and paste these as we need these going forward. That works. So we created a channel. Again, just to summarize the artifacts from that create channel that we need is the channel ARN, ingest endpoint, stream key, and playback URL. Broadcasting, we did look at OBS. There are other options, tons of different third-party desktop options. There's OBS, Streamlabs, GStreamer, StreamYard, many different ways. FFmpeg, you can actually broadcast directly from the command line if you wanted to for whatever reason. Um, if you didn't need that, well, actually the, the, the kind of cool way to do that is you can broadcast a pre-recorded video. So if you had an MP4 on your machine, you could use FFmpeg to stream that on your live channel without, obviously you don't need camera input for a pre-recorded video. So that's a cool way to do that. All the SDKs, there are hardware encoders, there's IP cameras. Again, pretty much anything that produces RTMP will work to broadcast. We looked at OBS broadcast. I do wanna show you, because I think this is a really cool feature we have a web broadcast SDK. So instead of relying on these third-party software options that work just fine and they're very powerful tools, you can create different scenes in OBS and um, share your desktop and you know, share your video game stream, whatever. They're powerful, they're helpful, but sometimes you're, you just need to allow your users to stream their camera and maybe share their desktop and their audio, and you wanna do it in as simple as way, a way as possible. So web broadcast is how you would do that. I'm not gonna write the code because there's a little more involved here, but I will show you kind of a pre-written uh, version of it. So we, first thing we do is include that web broadcast SDK from this, the CDN. You could, of course, install this locally I find it a little easier to just use the CDN version, especially because there are sometimes, like for the player SDK, there's some issues that, not issues, but considerations that you need to keep in mind because it uses WebAssembly and it's a little harder to, you have to make sure that those WebAssembly files aren't included in your, like, um, your packed output so uh, too much to get into right now. But a first, the first thing you need to do is get permission. So any web application needs to have permission to access a user's camera and microphone that makes sense. We don't want these cameras just turning on behind the scenes in a web page without our knowledge and recording us or streaming us to some random endpoint. So we need to get permission. That's what we do online 13. 
We create an instance of the broadcast client. We tell it what our stream configuration is. This has to do again with those standard versus basic channels, transmux versus transcoded. And then tell it the ingest endpoint. And this is the exact same thing as the one we used in OBS, but without the RTMP prefix. It's just the uh, domain for that. We can create a preview element on our page. Obviously, if you're streaming, your, your user is streaming from the web, it would be nice for them to see what they're streaming. So you have a canvas element on your web page. You attach the preview to that canvas element. Grab the devices, in other words, the cameras and microphones right here. We can filter them based on the type or the kind of device. So you need to get a handle for the device. This allows you to prevent like a drop down menu that says if you have multiple cameras, you could pick which camera. So this just gets a list of all those devices. Then you need to get a then you need to get a stream. So you use again get user media. This time on line 35, passing the device ID. So again, if you have that drop down menu, you store the device ID and you can change it uh, that way. Same for the microphone. You add the video input device and audio input device, line 47 and 48, to the broadcast client. And then you have a button that says, do I want to start streaming? Am I ready to start streaming? And if, if the toggle is, if you're not broadcasting essentially, you call start broadcast or you call stop broadcast on the client. So you just start broadcast, you pass it that stream key. Obviously don't store this in your hard code it in your application and then check it into version control because anybody that has that key can broadcast to your channel. So let's run this. And very simple. Obviously, uh, again, the first thing it does is prompt me for permission. So I say, yes, go ahead, please do. I have a, the canvas element on the page here. This is my preview that I'm showing to my user. This is a very basic example, obviously. If we get our stream key from our code, from our response from creating the channel. If I open up console here and I click toggle broadcast, you see very, very tiny font here, but it says broadcast started down there. So right now, via the web, I'm broadcasting to this new channel. We can again confirm that in the console. This is demo two, the channel we just created. We've been broadcasting for 12 seconds. If we click that, we see our web broadcasted video. So. And you can see the latency if you look at my hand there. I mean, it's pretty, pretty darn good even over this Wi-Fi. Now it's finally working. So, yeah, that is the web broadcast SDK. Check the time here. Okay. We, uh, so I started at 3, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, Google. Oh, I hope nobody has a Google device. All right, I guess we're not going back into full screen. So playback, let's talk about playback quickly. We have 20 minutes, but this will be fairly easy to demonstrate. So playback, again, we have a player SDK. There are integrations that I'll show you in just a minute with other third-party libraries. There's something called video.js. There is JW player, so there's third party libraries for media playback that you can use. The ultra low latency and um, the other nice thing about our SDK is it is adaptive. So if you're on a really good connection, you're streaming at 1080, you're receiving that 1080p stream on a transcoded channel, and let's say you walk into this room with the terrible Wi-Fi and the player realizes that the quality of your network changed, it will automatically lower that 
um, the quality of your stream down to 480 or whatever it has to to keep that latency low. So it will do that on the fly in the middle of a stream. It's not just load the page, figure out the best, and then keep going. The player is intelligent enough to change that quality as you go. So we're going to create a playback experience here. To do that, we need our playback URL. So I'll set that into a variable. And that is, the, again, the response from <clears throat> my uh, SDK call to create the channel. Then to create the player, we call ibsplayer.create. We then attach that to just a standard video element, which is a uh, shown down here, just a video tag, your standard variety HTML video tag. So we attach that to that. We call load, passing it the stream URL. So this is the actual playback URL that we want. And then we say play. So if we start that server back up locally, oh, it's already running. So we go back to the demo. I should probably not have navigated away from here because that was what was broadcasting. <laughs> so let's start that broadcast back up. <clears throat> and we'll go to our playback demo. And you can see it's already playing. So as soon as I loaded the page, those five lines of code, my web broadcasting is now playing back right here in the player. What else can we do here? Quickly, I will show you this, and I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to copy and paste these. Actually, I'll just show you. Well, I will copy and paste them. No, actually, I don't even have to do that. I will go to the solutions directory and show you that. So solutions, IBS player. I won't do that because that doesn't have the stream URL <laughs> for what we were just looking at, the brand new channel. OK, back to the demo, back to the player. So we will, first of all, mute this. And in solutions, I will copy. All of these. And paste them over here. So what do we have here? We can add listeners. So we have player state events that are fired for playing and ended. So if you wanted to do things like update the UI to show a little badge that says live, and you know, change it when, it when the broadcast stops, change it to say offline or something like that, we can do those. We have a listener for metadata. So this is what I briefly mentioned earlier, and um, we'll look at this really quickly here. Timed metadata. What is timed metadata? It's an actual event that you can emit via our SDK at a specific point in time from your broadcast. So it's actually embedded within the stream as an ID3 tag that is actually within the stream. It's not a, anything else that comes through any kind of event bus or anything. It's embedded in the stream that you can listen for on the player side of things. And this allows you to do things like, um, say if you're doing a gaming application and you want to uh, inject the score into your stream at, a, at whatever point in time that that score was captured. Or if you're doing like an e-commerce application, a shopping, and you wanted to feature a product you could, at that very point in time, embed the ID of the product for the live stream viewers, a special sale on this product right now, you know, and last for 30 seconds. You can embed that in the stream. The cool thing about this is because it's embedded within the stream, when you go to play back that stream later on, that event still exists at that point in time in the stream, so you could replay that same event on playback. It's not just for live streams. Other things we can do with the player SDK is get the quality, the bit rate, the live latency, and the buffer. So if we save this and we reload, we see some output in the console. I will make that a little bigger so you could see all that. 
So we have the quality. Right now it's running at 1080p. We have our bit rate, which is 6,000 kbps. Our live latency is 1.5 seconds. That's fantastic on this 1.1. For this Wi-Fi, I'm very impressed. And our buffer is very small at this point. So we have access to all of these things via the player SDK. I will comment this, actually I'll delete this really quickly because it's on a loop, so I'm gonna reload. And let's again look quickly at this metadata event. So in order to demonstrate this, we're going to need the channel ARN. So to publish, we need the channel ARN. And if we come over here and we say, we can do this via the SDK, we can do it via um, the CLI, various different ways. But if we paste in that channel ARN and we publish this text metadata, this simple JSON string, and we come back to our player here, did I not? Did I do wrong? Okay, this should be right. There it is. Don't know why I missed that other one. So at that point in time, in other words, 1.023 seconds into the stream, we have this metadata event that was published. We can deserialize that JSON, do whatever we need to do with that. So there are a lot of possibilities for this, as I said. But uh, that, again, exists in that embedded stream. We can use that in playback. Interactivity. We won't have a ton of time to do this, but we do support chat rooms. So you can create your own IVS chat room, you can do this via the CLI, the SDK, the console, that's the CLI command. This is uh, how you create a token. As I said earlier, we need a token in order to manage user uh, moderation, things like that. So you just use the SDK, create a chat token. We will not demo creating a chat, but I could demo, well, uh, I could demo it actually in action. There's nothing amazingly spectacular about this because it's your standard variety um, chat room type experience. But we have a simple chat room. We have diff different tabs and we can pass messages back and forth. This uses your standard WebSockets, so you get an endpoint, you get a, uh, create a connection via JavaScript to this uh, WebSocket endpoint, you pass the token as a second argument, and then we can, via the SDK, do things like, again, like I said, moderate chat. We can, <laughs> I have to be careful about this, um, because I don't want to offend anybody, but we can put in swear words and, uh, if we had a little more time, I would show you how this is done. It's actually a Lambda function. So you can put a Lambda function in line and all your incoming messages get rerouted to that Lambda. You can do um, allow list substitution for bad words. You can use a third party library that substitutes bad words. You can just outright reject the message if you wanted to. If somebody came in and said Todd Sharp is dumb and I could compare that, I could say no. We're not allowing that message to be posted, and it just won't be delivered, which is nice. You do have a limitation of, I think, 200 milliseconds, which is low, but for performance purposes, you're not gonna end up sending that to a translation service, for example, because that response is just not going to be fast enough. So you can do limited things. You can do, uh, there are libraries that you can include in that Lambda that do swear word lookups and things like that, but it's a cool feature. It's a, it's a powerful feature in conjunction with manual moderation. So it should always be kind of a two-prong approach, right? You should always have something automated to catch as much as you can and then a human to 
click that button that says delete that message. That be, is broadcasted as an event to all connected users, and then you can delete that from the UI to make sure that it is no longer there. We looked at time to metadata already. There is a free tier if you're interested. For new accounts, you get five hours of video input per month, 100 hours of output. So essentially 20 users watching one broadcaster for five hours, five times 20 is 100. You can get 13,500 messages sent per month and 270,000 delivered. Again, that's 13,000 times 20, is, that's where they get that number. So you could have a chat room with 20 people delivering 13,000 messages. And there's also a cost estimator if you wanna go beyond the free tier at that website, ibs.rock slash calculator. It gives you a general idea of at this quality video, this much input hours delivered to this many people, how much will this cost me? So you can check that out. Some other links, I do blog quite a bit on Dev2. There are our documentation links. That's my personal website at the bottom. And I thank you all for attending. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.